All right, Ephesians. As we left off, just a recap, uh, last month, uh, we went through Ephesians 1, 7 through 13, which has seven blessings that are in Christ, both past, present, and future. Uh, you can review those. And then we went through Ephesians 7 through 19, where Paul prayed for their understanding may be enlightened in three things. So he prayed for them. He said, uh, and he prayed that their understanding would be enlightened or increased or enhanced in understanding the hope of their calling, of God's calling, and we talked about that. Very important to understand your calling and the hope that comes with that, and that he wanted them to really have the most understanding of what that meant. And he also, he prayed what, that they would understand what are the riches of his inheritance in the saints. And we talked about that, there is an inheritance. Do we understand it? And there's promises to those who are called and understanding, understanding that. And then we left off with the third thing, the third aspect, which is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. So those are the three things that Paul prayed for in their understanding, that it would be enlightened, increased, enhanced, uh, and rich in understanding. And we'll pick it up on verse 19. And that's the third area we just mentioned, which is the, under, the understanding of, that Paul shares with Ephesians uh, and what is the greatness of his power towards those who believe. All right, so we'll pick that up there. Um, and we see that in verse 19. And he writes, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Now, these are a lot of words here, and as we'll see in a moment, Paul is trying to use every possible word that he can think of in Greek to show just how amazing this power, how great it is, how exceeding it is, uh, and, what it, and, and how it works in this one verse. Uh, let me just share with what Expositor says. Expositor's Bible commentary says this, the final item Paul wants his readers to recognize is the enormous power of God. It is presented here as incomparably great. Only Paul among the New Testament writers employs this term, hyperbalon, and that's the word for exceeding. Hyperbalon, literally ex it suggests that the conception it is attached to is thrown over into another sphere altogether. This unimaginable potency is directed towards all who believe. Here it is. Here is its intended destination. So that's what Exposure says about the word hyperbolic, and that's the word exceeding there, exceeding. So it's, it's this word that just put it, puts it to another whole level. It, it was this level, and you put a hyperbolic in front of it, it just like takes it to another level that is beyond even that we can imagine. It means surpass or exceed or transcend, hyperbolic. And again, Paul is the only New Testament writer to use, to use this term. He actually uses it four other times um, to express what he's trying to say. And he says, and I'll give these to you, there's four different places to show how he uses this word hyperbalon. And here, they, instead of using exceeding, they use the word surpassing. And in 2 Corinthians 3.10, he says, surpassing glory. So there's glory, but there's surpassing, or exceeding, there's hyperbalon, or hyperbalo. Uh, and, and it's a, to show just how exceedingly great it is. And he also uses it in 2 Corinthians 9.14, when he uses the word surpassing grace. Uh, Ephesians 2.7, he says, in surpassing riches. And in Ephesians 3.19, he says, in surpassing knowledge. So it's hyperbalo, you know, this word is being used to show, it takes it to another whole extent, another whole level. Uh, beyond, and he's using this word on purpose to show how great it is. Now, let me read expositors again on this section because there's some other things that are very interesting here to see uh, this being used to show the power and how great it is and what God's doing, working in us. Expositors Bible Commentary says, Paul proceeds to collect all the cinnamons, cinnamons, <laughs> cinnamons he can lay hands on. It describes how the power, which is dynamis, of God functions according to the operation or energia and the strength, 
Kratos of his might, Isagus, and the dynamics is capable of potential energy and is effective for operational power. Kratos is power exercise and resistance and control. Isagus used of bodily strength and muscular force is inherent vital power. So uses four words there in case you didn't catch what I just said. <laughs> uses hyperbalo to begin with, but then uses dynamis, means power, he used the word power. Uh, energia, and that sounds familiar, energia to show the working is, is translated as working, and strength, krato, and uh, iskis, which means might. And these are all very powerful words to show strength, power, uh, and he collects them all and puts them together to show the power that God has at his disposal and how that same power is working in us. And we're reminded of 2 Timothy 1.7, which says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. God's spirit provides us godly power. Paul is reminding Timothy the power that comes with God's spirit doesn't result in being fearful. And that's the way we should look at God's power. He gives us part of his spirit, part of his power that Paul's talking about here in many colorful terms to show how great it is to show what's working in us. And we can have difficulties, challenges, and trials where things don't seem to be working out. But God has given us his spirit, which is powerful in giving us confidence, faith, and trust in God. His power will guide and deliver us and strengthen us if we use it. And God gives each one of us a measure of his Holy Spirit when we're baptized. When the minister lays on the hands, his hands on you when you're baptized, he's giving you his spirit and a measure of the spirit. Then it's up to us to increase in that spirit, but there's power there in overcoming and, 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 and working in us. That same power that raised Christ from the dead, from flesh to spirit, is the same power that God is working in us to become like Christ. It's the same power, it's the same spirit in there. And, that, and he will use his power to raise up, he raised Christ from the dead, and that same power will be used to raise us from the dead if we die yeah, before Christ returns. But that, that's what Paul's talking about, this power. And we shouldn't underestimate it. First Corinthians 15, 42. Let me give you uh, some reference scriptures. And this very applies well today. Uh, it give us reassurance. But this power is what we're talking about that God has to raise, ultimately raise a body that's died to glory, to power. First Corinthians 15, 42, 43. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, is raised in incorruption, is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness. It is raised in power, right? That's the word, power. How does that happen? That's God's power that does that. We are the flesh, we're weak, we have corruption, but God's power, raised in power. That's what he's talking about here. That's what Paul's talking about when he goes back to the, to the verse we talked about. Philippians 3.20, Philippians 3.20, another reference scripture. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. That's the power that's going to do that. Let's remember that the exceeding greatness of his power is directed towards us who believe, right? Let's never underestimate. God has given us uh, his power. Now, it may not be the power, you know, it's, it's a power to change, the power to withstand difficulties, to go through trials, and it's ultimately the power to change, to be like Christ, to have the nature of Christ, to have the character of God. That same very power worked in Christ, the same very power worked in Christ when he was here on earth. Let's go to verse 20. We see that back to Ephesians 1, verse 20. Ephesians 1, verse 20. Ephesians 1, 
Ephesians 120 back there. So it says, Paul writes, which he worked, again, we're talking about his power, which he worked, the power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And we'll see that in, verse, and we'll see that in chapter 2 again, except it's not Christ, it's us. But he starts with Christ. He's the firstborn. So he seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Well, that's a, that's a good image to have. The power of Christ raised from the dead. What do the people, most people today have two images in their minds when they think of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ on the cross, in a weakened state, or baby manger, in, his, in the manger, baby creatures in the manger. How sad is that? Here we see Christ, when he's raised up by the power of God, seated at his right hand in heavenly places, far above, right? All principality, all in power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come. That's the Jesus Christ who is a high priest who's working on your behalf every day if you go to him. Christ has been raised to glory above all things. Matthew 18, 18 says, Christ said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. That's the Jesus Christ that we're talking about. Paul has a similar statement in Colossians 1. And then we can see that what God was having Paul focus on in his epistles that became scripture. Colossians 1, let's see more here about the power of Jesus Christ, and the power that was raised up and put him in, a, in his right hand of God. And we'll see who Jesus Christ is. Even today, there's confusion. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is he? Even the Church of God, sometimes we have confusion of who Jesus Christ is. But there should not be confusion. Let's read in Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15. Paul writes, He is, this is Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Colossians 1, 15 through 18. Let's go back to Ephesians 1, verse 22. Again, the same idea is being presented here by Paul. We just read Ephesians 1, verse 22. Back to Ephesians. Verse 22, Paul writes, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So as we go through Passover... Again, it's important to understand who is the head of the church. <coughs> Thank you for the water this time. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He's the, he's the head. And he puts members in his body as he wishes for a purpose. Everybody has a purpose Every part does this, everybody, every member does its part for the edifying of each other. That's the body. So that's the end of uh, chapter one. Uh, let me just summarize chapter one before we go to chapter two. Again, from verses three to four, three to fourteen, Paul reenumerates the blessings in him, past, present, and future. In verses, 15 to 23, in verses 15 to 23, Paul asks God to grant his readers to comprehend how great their calling is. Jesus Christ has been exalted to preeminence in the heavenly places. He is ahead over all things to the church. Who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ. And he will share those blessings forever with those 
who are in Christ. A wonderful first chapter of Ephesians. Beautifully written. You can read it over and over and over again. And there's so much meaning in that first chapter of Ephesians. And, and may God enable us to comprehend what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Wonderful, wonderful understanding there by given to Paul to write down for us. All right, let's go to chapter 2. Chapter 2. Now, chapter 1 describes the blessings of what God is doing in Christ, and, and now Paul makes a pivot to start of chapter 2 to remind the Ephesians the road that they were on, the road they were on. And Ephesians 2 Verses 1 through 10, I have from being dead in trespasses to being made alive as a summary. Let's go to verse, let's go to verse 1, chapter 2. Paul writes, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Paul reminds the Ephesians and all of us that we were dead in trespasses and sins. Certainly, the focus is on Gentile converts. Of Ephesus. But this describes all mankind. We're all on this path. We had trespasses, which means a falling away, a lapse, a, fail, a false step. Who hasn't had a false step? A trespass. We've all had sins, or missing the mark, as that word means. Although alive in the flesh, alive in the flesh, we're all sitting here breathing, blood going through our veins. We were spiritually dead without God's spirit in us. We have a chemical existence with a limited shelf life that lasts so long. That's, that's, that's not being alive. That's just having a shelf life. <laughs> and that's what we are. Without God's spirit, that's what, that's what we have. A limited shelf life. And, and that's all we have. And we see from the very beginning this idea of a limited shelf life unless God gives you his spirit. Adam and Eve had a beginning, had an opportunity to take the tree of life. And they would have been given God's spirit. A chance to be able to have eternal life. But this is what, in Genesis 2, 17, God tells him, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat it, eat from it, you will surely die. Now, they didn't die at that very moment. They didn't get struck by lightning. They didn't just fall down dead. But they had a limited shelf life. but they were dead spiritually. They did not have access to eternal life. They chose their own course, their own path, with the influence of the serpent, Satan, the devil, as you'll see in verse 2. And that's where everybody who has sinned had a trespass. They, they are condemned to death. Ezekiel 18.4. Ezekiel 18.4, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins will die. Ezekiel 18.4. And that's the, that's the, that's what, we all had trespasses. We all had sins. Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, so also death was passed on to all men because of all sin. Again, this is the state we're in. We all have a limited, you know, we're, we do not have eternal life, and sin is a part of that. Romans 6.23, the wages, what we earned of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 John 3.4, whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So we see very clearly, they all have sinned, all has trespassed, and the result is not eternal life. Let's go to verse 2. 
So he's, again, Paul's going back, this is where you're at. All, you know, he all had trespasses and all had sin. In verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So everybody was walking, as it were, in this age, this world, a certain way, whether they knew it or not. Uh, Matthew 7.13 says, For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. And, I, and, I, and that's the way we were all. We're on this course. We were on this road. We were in this, and I, I always have this picture. I think I've used it here several times. Where this eight or nine lane highway. Everybody's going it's slightly downhill. <laughs> and we're all on this eight or nine highway, eight or nine lane highway. Let's make it 10 lane highway. It's very broad, very broad, as it says. And everybody's going this, it's slightly downhill, so it's an easy path to take. And some people are riding their bikes, and some people are walking, and some people are strolling, and some people are going as fast as they can in the fastest car to destruction. But whatever the case, everybody's going down this road. And everybody was on this course, or this, in this age, according, walking according to this age, which was influenced by the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. And that's the way everybody was. That's the way we all were, whether we knew it or not. People living whatever lives, that's the way they were. That way, or that is age, was set by the decision that Adam and Eve made and by the influence of the prince of the power of the, of the air. Prince of the power of the air influenced the whole value system of the world. Three broad areas of influence, or pulls, that Satan uses. The prince of the power. We should know this. First John 2.15. There's three broad things. And they all pull. They all look good to us. And everybody, every human ever born eventually gets to some point in age and like is influenced by any of these three things or all, one or multiple of these ideas. First John 2.15. John writes, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Well, here John defines three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That sums up everything. But look, and... These are the same three things that Satan tempted Eve with in the garden. I think you've heard that before, right? Uh, when the, in Genesis 3, 6. Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, right? The lust of, uh, the, lust of the eyes, it looked good. It was pleasant, or, and it was pleasant to the eyes. Again, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, it would taste good. It looked good. And the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took of it and ate. It took of its fruit and ate. The pride of life, it looked good. The knowledge, uh, desire to look wise. The pride of life, the same three things, right? That's how John sums it up. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. They saw, so Eve saw that was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes and, and desirable to make one wise. The same three things. The, the three temptations that Satan presented to Jesus can also map to the same three things, the lust of the flesh, the bread, you know, have some bread, you're hungry, you know, you must be hungry. The lust of the eyes, hey, all these kingdoms can be yours. Just, step up, just, walk, just bow down and worship me. And the pride of life, you know, he, he, how do you do that? The pride of life, he said, if you're the son of God, then jump off and see if he'll save you. You know, it's that ego. He's, he's kind of get to the ego. Well, he's trying to appeal to, to Jesus Christ in that temptation. The desire to be wise or the, the, the pride of life or the ego that might be there that we all have. Well, and, and Christ just dismissed all those. Those aren't, those are, those, those aren't done doing anything to me. He, and he quoted back scripture correctly to Satan. But Satan's always going to have these same temptations. And they're all summed up by those three things there. That's the course of this world. That's the way we we're all walking. Something was one or three of those things were all appealing to us. Right, and that's and you look around. That's the way the world's working. Everybody's motivated by one of those three things, you know. Oh, the lust of the flesh, you know, the things that kind of make you feel good temporarily, or the lust of the eyes. Oh, it's so good to have that car, or that house, or that vacation home, or whatever. May or those set of clothes, 
and, or pride of life, who you are in this world, who you are, to rise up and be somebody in this world and be, and be seen as being somebody. Those are all the, that's what everybody pretty much is walking on this course of this world on. So the prince of the power of the air describes how Satan can broadcast attitudes. So the prince of the power of the air, Satan broadcasts these things that seem appealing, and he does it through attitudes. Let me read to you from the Mystery of Ages to help understand this better. Um, Mystery of Ages, chapter 4, pages 143. This is what Mr. Armstrong writes. In Ephesians 2, 2, Satan is called the prince of the power of the air, working in inside the minds of the of people. He says, I could never have understood this until, one, I had understood how radio and television sounds and pictures are transmitted through the air, and two, I learned the truth about the human spirit in the human brain. If your radio is set on the proper radio wavelength or television set to tune, is tuned to the proper channel, the broadcaster's message comes through clearly. Satan, as prince of the power of the air, broadcasts not in, wor not in words, uh, sounds or pictures, but in attitudes, moods, and impulses. That's from, that's from the Mystery of Ages. And I think we, we should never underestimate that. Never underestimate that. We as saints and being holy as God is holy should take extreme care to not to tune in to Satan's broadcast of attitudes and mindsets and emotions. And we can so easily do that. What do we watch on TV? What do we listen to? What do we read? Who do we choose as friends? Is what we tune into really that harmless, or is there an attitude we're picking up? All these can influence our attitudes, our emotions, our thoughts, or how we view things. You know, sometimes, you know, if you have a burst of anger, or a burst of, you know, you just feel angry or you feel, you know, whatever ungodly uh, approach you really may have. Sometimes you just pause, like, where did that come from? It might just come from your own self, but where, you know, where did that idea, uh, uh, trace it back? Where, were you, where was, what was influencing you? Why do you have these sort of emotions or attitudes or things sometimes that come in our minds and they're like, oh, that wasn't very godly. That wasn't a very godly outburst of, of anger or malice or envy or uh, whatever it may be, right? We have these things that, hap that we're influenced by. Don't underestimate that Satan is constantly blasting out these attitudes and thoughts. Uh, and, 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 and we should really be careful what we immerse ourselves into uh, and what we tune into. Our thoughts and attitudes can be influenced. And we should really think about that. Uh, what we, you know, don't underestimate how the, the ideas, the thoughts that kind of start impacting in your life. Ephesians 6.11, Ephesians 6.11, just to show, you know, what we're really up against, what we're really up against. Ephesians 6.11, uh, this is the end of, you know, jumping away ahead of the book of Ephesians here, but let's use this scripture that applies here. Ephesians 6.11 Paul writes, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of, dark, of the darkness of this age. Right? We're in this age, this course, this age. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6.11. Recognize we're in a spiritual battle. We're fighting against attitudes and thoughts that are not from God or affect a godly perspective, meaning we need to be filling our minds and thoughts with the right attitudes. We need to tune into the right broadcast, you might say, the right wavelength. And, and if you're purposely turning yourself into like a radio station or a TV station or you have a clicker and you're purposely clicking on the things that really aren't going to feed your brain with the right attitudes and thoughts, and then we have bad outcomes in our, in our behaviors, you should really think about that. But what can we do to make sure we're tuned into the right things? 1 Thessalonians 5.16. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, Rejoice always. 
Pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Philippians 4 8. Philippians 4 8. Meditate on things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, and good. Report, uh, lovely, a good report, virtuous, and praiseworthy. That's a good, those are sounds like things we should tune our, you know, stations into, our radio stations into. Things that do these things. Uh, Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word, you know, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in grace, with grace in grace in your hearts to the Lord. You know, again, we're, we're focusing on the right things. This is how we're tuned into the right things. Set your minds, Colossians 3, 2, set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. Well, these are all things we can do to make sure that we're not tuning in to the prince of the power of the, of the air of this age who can impact emotions, attitudes, thoughts by what he puts out there. All in the backdrop, especially of like being motivated by the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the prior life. All those things we can tune into them and, oh, that seems so good. And it's really just in a bad spot. We have to make sure that we truly have an enemy, the devil, who can broadcast these things. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but spiritual powers of this age. And we have to realize that the power that God gives in us, the power, right, the power we talked about before, is being used to combat that. And we certainly, certainly should not put ourselves willingly in these places to just, oh, I'm going to go watch this not be impacted by it. Even the news, I would really caution you to how much news people watch. Right? How much news? How many people have I heard say, I watched the news and it made me so angry? <laughs> Maybe you don't watch the news. I don't say, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying put your head in the sand and, don't, and be ignorant. But whatever your news source is, I'm not telling you which one is the right one because I don't think any of them are right. But usually it's based on your political leanings. Well, watch any one of them and you'll come away angry because <laughs> you're so, because it always presents the other side is doing something wrong. And that gets you angry. Well, maybe we should think about that. Is it good to walk around angry? I, I, that's my family. <laughs> they don't want an angry Bill walking around the house because I watched the news and something got me upset, or something else, right? So I understand, don't be ignorant, read the news, um, but just be careful of the news and what's being transmitted in those messages, even in the news. All right. Paul goes on, the spirit or attitudes of Satan works in those who are disobedient. Disobedient uh, means willful disbelief. We don't want to be having willful disbelief. All right, back to Ephesians 2, verse 3. Ephesians 2, verse 3. Paul writes, Ephesians 2, verse 3, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, <laughs> fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So this is a path everybody was on. He's reminding the Gentiles, the Ephesians, look, this is where God's called you out of. Don't forget, you need to remember where you came from. God called you out of this world and brought you into the church, the body of Christ, and it had a, uh, with a holy calling, giving you the Holy Spirit. So he's reminding the Ephesians and us that they were at one time among those who were disobedient, whose conduct or actions reflected the Reflected chasing after the lust or desires of the flesh and mind. Actions as well as even the thoughts in our minds. So again, you go back to what Jesus said, Matthew 5, 27. Just not the actions, it's what's in our mind. He says, whoever looks on a woman, looks at a woman to lust, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So it's, it's what's in our mind as well as our actions. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus focused on what is in our mind and hearts, even if not coming out in our actions. So even if you have enough self-control, not to act on anything, any impulse, 
He's saying it's in your mind, in our hearts. We have to be, you know, uh, have those under control and dealt with. So he's, he, Paul talks about the nature, we're by nature children of wrath. The children of wrath are subject to wrath. There's a day which we all need to understand, which I know we do. There is a day when God's wrath will be seen on earth. Right? There will be a day when God's wrath will be seen on earth. And we don't want to be the children of wrath. That's what our, you know, the children of wrath, nature children of wrath. That's who we don't want to be. That's the path we were on. Um, and there will be a day when God's wrath is very well seen. Uh, John 3, 36. John 3, 36. John writes what Paul says, what uh, Jesus Christ said here. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son who does not believe the Son shall not see life. Again, we're talking about life. Shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So everybody's going to be given a chance. You know, we know that through the plan of God, even up to the last great day. Everybody will have a chance to believe the Son and see life. Uh, but if they don't, the wrath of God abides on that person. Colossians 3, 6. Colossians 3, 6. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Again, people who willfully disbelieve, disobey, are against God. The wrath of God is coming. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. And to wait for his son, he says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Again, who, who wants to be part of the wrath to come? Well, through Jesus, we deliver from that if you, have, if you believe in him and, and, and do what he says, not a hearer, but a doer, and accept him as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and he died for your sins, and, he gives, and God gives you his spirit, and then you can be delivered from the wrath to come. Revelation has many scriptures about the wrath of God to come on those who are ultimately disobedient. Again, ultimately everybody is going to have a chance. Everybody at some point is disobedient. Everybody either in this age, a few in this age, the first fruits, first fruits, those in the millennium, or those in the last great day will all have a chance. But anybody who just willfully is, I'm not going to do what God says, who willfully are disobedient, the sons of disobedience, they are going to experience the wrath of God. Revelation 19, verse 15. Revelation 19, verse 15. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God, and he has on his robe, on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Certainly a very different image than Jesus on the cross in his weakened state. This is Jesus Christ coming back and treading out the wrath of the Almighty God based on those who are disobedient. There is an aspect of that you can't forget. 